this is Dylan Moore with Irita TV, co-hosting here with Nima Majur over in Florida, also co-host. And today we have on Warren Mosler, the founder and imagination and creative drive behind modern money theory. We got we got the the source here today to talk some economics. And what we wanted to do was go over, Warren wrote a book some time ago. I'm sure he'll let us know when it was. I can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, going over some, I guess we can call it economic religion, uh, the seven <laughs> deadly innocent frauds of of uh, economic policy, I believe it was. And I, I just, yes. you know, as a, as a way to just kind of go over some basics of MMT, have that as a starting point. And, you know, we, we could talk from there and maybe get into some current events, and how these frauds relate to current events. Uh, so, first of all, thank you, Warren, for, for coming on the show. And it's it's great to see you. Good to be here. Good to be here. Excellent. So, Nima was just mentioning before before we started recording about if you wouldn't mind actually going into the story of your experience with the Italian government. Because that seems to be a defining moment in in how you 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 put together your description of modern monetary theory. Yeah, no, it's written it's written in the book, so I can't deviate from it too much. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we uh, the situation occurred uh, in the marketplace where you could borrow lira from the Italian banks at maybe ten percent and buy Italian government bonds, same maturity as you know uh, short term at maybe twelve percent. You could make 2% for doing nothing. Now, if the currency went down, you still make the same 2% profits in the lira, but it wouldn't be worth quite as much, but it was still no money for nothing, so to speak. Uh, however, the risk was that you borrow the lira, invest in the government bonds, and the government would default, and then you'd be stuck with the loans and not have any bonds and uh, make a massive loss. Okay. So the, the idea was we could come up with some reason why they weren't going to default which would be counter to what everybody else was saying, uh, including mainstream economists like Rudy Dornbush, who had done you know, volumes on why Italy was going to default. You'd come up with some reason that's wrong, then, then you had a good investment in these bonds and you could make a good return for your investors. So that, that's what kicked off the thinking in that direction. Okay. So uh, when I started thinking about it, of course, uh, so now I had reason to think about something I hadn't had reason to think about before, you know, why Italy may or may not fought. Well, Italy had its own currency, floating exchange rate, the lira. And I checked to see if with the rating agencies, if any country with that floating exchange rate had ever defaulted before. And the answer was yes, they had. They had like six defaults. One of them was Japan in 1943, owed the United States government yen and didn't pay. It's like, okay, I understand that. Uh, and then, then they had some Latin American defaults where the inflation was so high that the amount owed on the bonds was so tiny that nobody bothered to redeem the bonds because you might have you know, a zillion pesos worth of bonds, which is worth 23 cents or something. So technically, it was a default on 23 cents. One of the interesting defaults they all brought up was that uh, when the U.S. went out uh, off the gold standard, they considered that a U.S. government default because we had a promise to the money for gold and did. So the U.S. budget rating agencies, sees it, how we're concerned, had, had defaulted. So uh, for all practical purposes, there were no, no defaults of consequence you know, for, for this uh, purposes of this investment in voting exchanges. And, and then the answer is, why not? And the answer they would give you is, well, because they can always print the money. And that might be true, but there haven't been any defaults. and No one has ever, quote, printed the money. So even without printing the money, there haven't been any defaults. So it hurt to me there's a more fundamental reason why they don't default. And I was sitting with my research guy, a guy named Tom Schultz, having this exact same conversation. And it just dawned on me. I said, you know, when we buy treasure securities, it doesn't matter to us if we buy them from the Fed or from the Treasury. We send the money to the same place, so that we have a wire transfer from our bank back to New York to the Federal Reserve Bank. Uh, and then we own treasury bonds, which are just uh, time deposit at the Fed, right? So we're shifting money from one account to another. And so it's the same. For the private sector, it doesn't matter if it's the Fed or the Treasury. But 
the narrative is that when you're buying from the treasury, you're funding expenditures. So when you're buying from the Fed, they're just doing that to mop up excess reserves and offset operating factors just to support their policy work at the level they think is appropriate. All right, well, it's the exact same thing to the private sector time, us on our side of the ledger. It has to be the same thing. You know, they might account for it or describe it differently on their side of the ledger, but it's got to be one or the other. And so obviously it's monetary. It's to support interest rates. It has nothing to do with funding expenditures. Treasury is not, um, you know, from a standpoint of the government overall, the government overall is not selling treasury securities to fund expenditures. And looking very carefully at the accounts at the, at the Fed, which apply to all central banks, uh, they have a saying that we've known for 20 years before that, because that's what they do. You can't do a reserve drain without doing a prior reserve add, which means <laughs> right. which means you can't get blood from a stone. You can't the private sector can't pay for anything uh, until the government spends the money first. And spending would be called a reserve add. And they spend money to credit reserve accounts, so they call it a reserve add. When you make a payment, they debit your account, so they call that a reserve drain. So when reserve balances go up, they call it an add and just down they call it a drain. That's just how they talk inside the Fed. That's Fed speak, you know, for the Monetary operations of the staff. So, um, so they already knew that. Okay. That there's, you know, that the looking at it from the Federal Reserve's point of view, from, which is an agent of Congress, which they all perfectly well understand the whole idea of it being some kind of private company that's acting as something other than an agent of Congress is not correct. Okay? There's no validity to that notion. Uh, and they have to add the money before they can take it out. They spend first, and then some gets paid for taxes, and some they sell treasury securities, which uh, shifts those dollars from one account of that reserve accounts to security account. So that's all. So first comes the spending, and then comes the uh, payment by the private sector. And at the time, you know, we've known for twenty years that uh, you know. I, been participating in it for 20 years, where on the 15th of the month, when we had to pay for the securities that we bought, the Fed would come in and do repos, which is an expenditure. They'd add the money to our accounts. I was at Bankers Trust at one point, all the other deals. They'd come in and do a reserve ad. Then we had the funds to pay for the bonds. So the funds to pay for the bonds come from the Treasury. When there was a big tax payment date, they'd come in and do a repo. They'd add the funds that we then use to pay the tax. Today, they've added all those funds in advance. We call it quantitative easing, which there's no effect on the macro economy. It's just part of the offsetting of operating factors that we do in advance. It's played up to be something more than that, but it is as the data is now clearly demonstrated. Right. Um, after over a yeah. decade of it, nothing seems to have happened. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. 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 30 years in Japan. Yeah. And they say, well, you know, we just need a little more time. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> Fine. So uh so armed with that understanding is look, the reason Italy is not, uh, there's no default condition even on their computers, because if you look closely, they're spending the lira first. Some, they then debit, some accounts get debited to pay the taxes, and some get debited to buy securities after the fact to support their rate structure, which was 12%. And so I understood that. I talked to my clients, had a few clients at the time, and it still wasn't safe to buy the Italian bond because they didn't know that. Okay, then they could do anything. They could just announce one day they're not going to make payments, just like Japan did in 1943. But once right. they understand it, there'd be no reason to not do it. Right. So you're saying that the government itself didn't, yeah, yeah. May possibly didn't understand that they didn't have to right. default, and they could have chosen right. to when they didn't have to. Right. And, and that was the risk. Ahead. Yeah. Let me jump ahead. In 1998, uh, I had left at my firm in 1997. I had some disagreements with this, with the trader we'd hired to do the Russian fund. And it was just a convenient time for me to step down. So I've been out of this financial markets full time since the end of 1997, actually longer than I was in it. So, uh, and we, he had a similar position on in, in Russian securities, the Russian uh, GKOs, they're called, against the NDX, non deliverable force, uh, which, same thing, you know, Russia can always make these payments. I said, well, look, like in Italy, you need to go over there and talk to these guys so they know which buttons to push uh, 
if it, and don't do something that, don't push know, the big advice. red button you don't need to sort of yeah, or, <laughs> yeah. or worse so yeah he said no I, he said no i don't want to do that because then the spreads will go away and i won't be able to put more of this trade on and i go like whatever and that's when i left the firm i you know i had no yeah these guys anymore well, anyway 1998 august maybe 17th or everything like uh they just all got up and walked out of the central bank. They didn't turn the lights. And, um, and the, the whole, there were no transfers, nothing was made, and the bonds were all defaulted on. And all those positions went to zero, uh, temporarily at least, until three or six months later when they walked back in the bank and pushed the buttons and made the payments. The financial crisis in Russia, the ruble crisis, broke out with the brutal devaluation of the Russian ruble in August 1998. The causes were also numerous in this case. Its emergence was influenced, among other things, by the international contagion of that period following the Asian crisis of 1997. In addition to the decline in world commodity prices, Russia has seen a decline in productivity and a chronic fiscal deficit. Economic growth was also affected. To these was added the huge cost of the Chechen war. The financial crisis has led to an economic crisis with the government announcing its inability to pay its debts. The structure of financial markets in turn favored the emergence of the crisis. Market-based financing was low compared to that achieved through banks, and the government bond market was much more developed compared to that of private bonds. These observations highlight the absence of a history of corporate lending. Other observations related to the financial system are Enterprises are financed mainly by banks, whose source of financing is mainly deposits. Banks' securities portfolio is not diversified, with most securities being government bonds. On August 13, 1998, Russia's financial markets collapsed as a result of investor fears that the government would devalue the ruble and fears that Russia will become insolvent given the evolution of international reserves. Stock prices fell dramatically by up to 65%, prompting authorities to stop trading securities. On August 17, the government and the Central Bank of Russia issued a joint statement announcing widening the fluctuation band of the ruble against the dollar from 5.3 to 7.1 rubles per dollar to 6.0 to 9.5 rubles per dollar. Russia's debt denominated in national currency will be restructured in a way that will be announced later. A temporary moratorium of 90 days will be imposed on the payments of certain debts of the banks, including debts resulting from forward contracts on the exchange rate. The central bank, CBRF, repeatedly intervened in August 1998 by allowing banks to use required reserves to make payments, provided a stabilization of loans to troubled banks, and guaranteed deposits with the state-owned bank Spurbank. In total, the central bank increased its lending to commercial banks six times over a 10-month period since June 1998. Although the liquidity injection was made before the crisis broke out, the turmoil could not be avoided. The IMF and the World Bank have again intervened by providing $22.6 billion in financial support to support reforms and stabilize financial markets through swap operations on a huge volume of government bonds, GKOs, maturing against euro bonds. You know, I had major losses because of this Russian default. Now, there were other circumstances like a fixed exchange rate, but they still had the option to credit the accounts in rubles and just not give you any dollars, in which case, you know, they would have defaulted on the conversion promise, but they would have made their payments, which is all that the trade they had on my firm at the time. That's all they needed was to have the ruble payments be made. They didn't care about the conversion. Mm -hmm. Which is, Russia always had the ability to do it. It did it three or six months later. But right, and you were hoping on. you could have gotten there and spoken to them and say, you don't you don't have to do this before yeah. they did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. With, yeah. If, if this happens and that happens, you don't get up and walk out. You just push this button, credit the accounts, and let the conversion people negotiate what they're going to do about that. Meanwhile, you've got the ruble machine still there. You're running the country. You're paying the military. Teachers are getting paid, and you don't have a, a domestic disaster. Mm -hmm. So there's like there's no practical reason to not make the payment. Everything gets worse if you don't. Everything is stays good if you do, even if you have some inflation. That's just denomination. Nothing actually. Well, anyway, 
point there was uh, in, back in 2000 or 1992 or whatever it was in Italy. And, you know, I foresaw that I didn't want this to happen back then. Of course, the first time I went. And so the uh, guys at Harvard Management, the clients there, the gentleman, Louis Samuels, who I went with, they called, they had contacts to Harvard and set up a meeting with the uh, Treasury at the, uh, in Italy, Treasury Secretary, Assistant Treasury Secretary. There was um, Luigi Spaventa. And we went out to see him to talk about this because we wanted him to understand things before we could take that kind of risk. And uh, so we get into his office and I asked him, I said, okay, this is a hypothetical question, don't answer it, but why is Italy selling all these BTP and CCTs, that's what they call the bond spike? Is it to fund expenditures because you need to get the wear to be able to spend? Or is it because if you, when you first spend the money from those central bank credit accounts, if you don't sell these securities, then the um, Fed funds rate, the interbank rate, will go to zero when your policy rate is 12. And so you'll, you'll, you know, the checks will clear, but you'll fail to support your interest rate. So he's, he goes quiet because he didn't expect this, of course. There was a big gloom and doom there. They were all depressed at all these reports that they were doomed to default, you know, any minute. And he looks up and he says, no, the rates won't fall to zero. They'll fall to a half a percent because we pay interest on reserves of a half a percent. We had a support rate. I didn't know that because it wasn't material, which is the same thing we do now, by the way. We pick it up. Right. Rate. But they were way ahead of us. So, uh, and I said, okay, it will fall to a half a percent. And then he just jumps up in this, you know, epiphany. Or, or <laughs> he goes into this rant yeah. about... He's wearing a three-piece suit. He had a pipe, and he looks he had a British spoke British English. It was very much a, you know, looking like Keynes or something, right? <laughs> and uh, very astute guy. And obviously, he knew monetary operations because somebody else would have known what I was talking about. So fortunately, we got a guy who was was good. He was, you know, he knew his stuff. So uh, he gets up and he starts going into a rant against the IMF and how they're making the math pro cyclical and austerity and the whole thing, you know, when it's just a reserve trade. You know, and this whole thing is nonsensical. And, you know, all of a sudden the doom and gloom is totally gone. And we have, we had, it was supposed to be a 20 minute meeting. He starts calling in people from the other offices nearby and they come in and we explain it to them and they start making us cappuccino. They had this big, huge cappuccino machine that the government must have spent the whole time on. And, uh, you know, two hours later, we finally snuck out to our next meeting. And a week later, the announcements came out of Italy. No extraordinary measures will be taken. All payments will be met on time. And the crisis part went away. The rates were the same. They came down eventually because they decided to. But they made all their payments and life went on without any default risk. And spreads eventually went to went back to normal, to zero. It took a year or two as they drifted roll and roll. And anyways, we we then felt comfortable owning these securities because they did know which box to push and how it worked. And it was a good investment for our, our investors to move make good returns on that without you. So uh, it, it, it just cracks me up whenever whenever I hear this. Yeah. But, but I mean, both from the Italy story and, uh, and uh, yeah. unfortunately the Russian story is not a crack up because they, yeah. they didn't push the buttons. But it's, right. it's just, in a situation like this, it's just button pushing, right? Yeah, and we'll everybody be, we'll makes this, this huge deal. ordeal out of it. And oh my God, we're going to default and the sky's going to fall. And blah, blah, blah. It's like, I oh, just push this button. We're fine. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll get, what, what about the debt ceiling? That's just a political constraint. The U.S. could have very easily defaulted. So look, the distinction is between the ability to pay and the willingness. To yep. Pay. So there's always the ability to pay. That's, that's our point at Bonavante theory. Because it's more than that. If you're spending first and then that money gets used to pay taxes, like the ability to pay is not even like, it's not part of the, <laughs> well, and that, that actually it's leads us. Applicable. It's not applicable. <laughs> that, that actually leads us right into your your uh, first yeah. seven deadly innocent fraud, and then that's the name of Warren Mosler's book, Seven Deadly Innocent right. Frauds of Economic Policy. So well, we're yeah. going to go yeah. over the seven. Oh, and it's free. It's free online. You just download it and uh, read it. And it's fairly short, so uh, no excuses. Yeah, it's it's quick. <laughs> it's quick, good, and easy. It's it's yeah. it, it's it's not economic garbly gook. It's really it's yeah, really understandable. It's totally yep. non technical. Just one quick thing I wanted to interject before we get there. It sounds like from that Italian story that you told us, which was in the 90s, that was before the Italians were forced to adopt a different currency, the euro, correct? 
Yes, yes. And so at the time, we can see here that the individual European countries still had a sense of fiscal sovereignty, and you could actually go to one of them and talk to them. Yeah. And that's, I think, fundamentally what has changed in the European Union, because today yeah. they've sort of lost that uh, sense of independence to the euro, basically, and the people who are in charge of the euro. Is that correct? Yeah, I get... it, it, it's almost like the U.S. states went through. First was the Article of Confederation. The states were in charge. Then they turned it over to the federal government under the Constitution. And today, if New York State's having a problem, unemployment is higher there for some reason, price of oil went up, uh, they can't just go out and run counter-cyclical deficit spending or anything else. They rely on Congress. Right. And, uh, so the European Union, the way to think about it is that Italy, Germany, they've turned themselves into what are like U.S. states, Connecticut, Florida. And, and, and it works. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay, but you're then relying on the central government for fiscal policy. It, and, uh, it works if there is an agreement that if we run into trouble in these uh, in certain states, yeah. the only source of um, of extra spending of net uh, private savings is the federal government, and not the right. state. And so, if you look at last year, Italy ran a deficit of 11 percent of GDP because the uh, European Commission, the finance ministers had decided that that's appropriate. So they, they now understand explicitly, but they may have understood all along, that the 3% deficit limit is now a policy tool. And if you think it's better, that as long as you decide you want it to be 11, it can be 11. You're not going to bounce checks. The spreads aren't going to widen out. As long as the central bank is guaranteeing the debt through the do what it takes to prevent the fall. And since they didn't write it down, they uh, reinforce it by buying some of their bonds. If they'd write it down, they wouldn't have to buy any of their bonds. They obviously grow anyway. Just think about that. If the European Central Bank guaranteed your debt, personally, how many euros could you borrow? Quite a bit. Right. <laughs> Pretty good interest rate too, right? So <laughs> minus a half percent. So um, so they've got the guarantee uh, from the Central Bank. They're under the umbrella. And the limits a policy tool, the same way it is here, Congress decides. In the same way now we've got Congress deciding we have to have a lower deficit. They may decide they have to have a lower deficit, but it's just, you know, the analogy is not, it is pretty good. Now the political um, channels are entirely different. You know, and the, the democratic um, controls, if you want to call it that, represent, the representation is entirely different. But economically sure speaking, it's. Yeah, I'm not, yeah, you know, we elect members of Congress who make these rules. They don't do that. They elect the European Parliament, but they don't make these rules. This is what the Commission and the appointed people make these rules. Central banks not appointed by the European Parliament. There's no electoral, direct electoral process. But at the end of the day, I'm not sure how much that matters. I mean, I like the sound of it that you get to elect your officials, but how important that is, I'm not sure. You know, if you look at where the material control comes from, you've got lobbying groups and you've got Special interests, and you have you know, people being threatened behind the scenes. Right, you get, you get the usual human drama going on. That's probably you know more of a factor than a lot of people realize. Well, what we were talking about before, you, you were mentioning yeah. about um, that these governments can't bounce their checks depending and you know this, further yeah. down the conversation if if we've got a fixed exchange rate, but we're not talking about that. It leads yeah. right. It leads right into your first deadly innocent yeah. fraud, which yeah. is uh, the federal government must raise funds through taxation or borrowing in order to spend. In other words, yes. government spending is limited by its ability to tax or to borrow. Now that's the fraud, yeah. and yeah, Warren's no, going to tell say, us the solution, the the reality. Yeah. yeah. So, so right now that's or it's been the case. It's starting to change, right, in the last two years because of modern monetary theory. But the the biggest takeaway from modern monetary theory is what I just talked about. You know. Governments are spending is not revenue constraint. Okay, you don't. Um, you're spending first, okay, and then taxes get paid. So the I once you understand the sequence, okay, then all these issues of solvency and that's crowding out that type of thing just they're not applicable anymore. Once you understand the sequence, the congressmen have the sequence wrong. They think the sequence is they've got to get dollars first before they can spend them. 
But the actual sequence is the taxpayer has to get dollars first before he can pay his taxes. So that turns that overturns every economic mainstream model that's ever been put out. Yeah, and, and literally overturns. It's backwards. Like, up, up yeah, becomes yeah. down. Yeah. You know, G, G minus T equals this and all that. Everything in there is that based on, you know, they have to get, there's an imperative to bring in dollars through taxing or borrowing to be able to spend. And the, the narrative was from President Obama. You know, you know, we've all, they say, if you run out of money, well, we've already, when are we going to run out? We've already run out of money. You know, we're not taking in enough in taxes. We have to go borrow from China to leave the debt to our grandchildren. To right. Understand. China that can't but, create dollars, but the U.S. Yeah. government can create dollars. <laughs> right. Yeah. The sequence yeah. The sequence is backwards. The sequence is the government spends first. China gets some of that money because we buy hair dryers at Walmart or whatever. And then they buy government bonds with some of that money after the money's already been spent. Okay, so we're not getting borrowing from China in order to spend. Okay, now, um, so that was that's a big MMT um, contribution that hasn't been in the history of thought. It's been implied a little bit if you go back to things people said. It's never explicitly been pointed out like, hey, you know, you've got the sequence backwards. It's not how it works. Well, so uh, now the question is, what we also point out is that what the government does need. It, the limitations are what is offered for sale in exchange for dollars. You know, you can't buy anything unless there's somebody out there selling it. So, I mean, is that the Italian government calling <laughs> or the Russian uh, government? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, right. So, like, why would anybody sell anything for dollars? Nobody sells anything. Looking for Confederate dollars, you can the South can Richmond can have a big pile of those. You're not going to be able to buy anything. Okay, uh, so where where does the money story start? How does it come? Where, and so we tell the money story different to incorporate, which incorporates the proper sequence. It, it begins with a tax liability. The most the critical part of the monetary system is the tax liability. Without that, there is no monetary system. And the dollar, the yen, those are the tax credits that satisfy the tax liabilities as described in the tax liability. So let's say the government puts a tax on everybody's house. They say, to, you owe us $10,000 or else you're going to lose your house. So number one, there's a tax liability. And number two, they tell you it's dollars. That's the tax credit. That the unit need, of yeah. measurement, right? Yeah, that you need or else we're going to take your house away, burn your house down, whatever you're going to do. So... Uh, so the tax liability is critical. So when you see these uh, MMT proponents saying taxes don't fund spending, well, tax liabilities fund spending, if you want to look at it abstractly. I mean, they don't provide the revenue that you need to spend. But it gives value. Provide, they yeah. provide things offered for sale that you need to be able to spend. And so the limits of government at any one time is what is offered for sale in exchange for dollars. And that's limited to the demand created by the tax liabilities. And if you want to spend, you want to buy more things than, than that, interestingly, you've got to do something different. One thing you can do is lower your prices. The government decides to pay half for everything that it's been paying for. The tax liability is the same. It's going to get twice as much stuff because the government, the private sector needs the government's money to pay the tax. The government's telling it what it has to do to get it every time it spends. You serve in the army, I'll give you fifty thousand dollars a year. The total tax liability is fifty thousand dollars for the whole economy. You're going to get one soldier. You might get one and a half. If somebody wants to save. It's going to get one soldier. If it says I'm going to pay twenty five thousand. It's going to get two soldiers. If it says I'm going to pay a hundred thousand, it's going to get a half a soldier. <laughs> get a part time soldier because they only need fifty thousand as defined by your tax liability. Right? So that's a critical piece of the understanding that. It's slopped over. The price so, level can, 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 price I re, can I repeat that back to you to make sure yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I got that correctly? So you're saying so the, you got the federal government. The federal government needs stuff, and yes. it, it offers these these tokens that are just something that it made up. And in order for people to need those tokens, they say, okay, we're going to tax you in those tokens, and yes. the amount that they're going to tax reflects how much people are willing to work for that money, right? Well, so, the amount they're going to tax creates an absolute need. Right. So if you're the one guy being taxed and they say the tax is 100 tokens, 
you have to come up with a hundred tokens. You're going to lose your house, go to jail or something. Right. And so right. they say, oh, okay, uh, you know, a car costs a hundred tokens. So you can have to give me a car. If right. They say, oh, a hundred tokens is a half hour's work. And you don't have to work a half hour. They have the, they have what you need and they tell you what you have to do to get it. They're pitching and you're catching. Mm-hmm. Not the other way around. And that's why I say the currency is a public phenomenon. They got it. You need it. They set price. That that fascinated me the first time I heard you say that is that yeah. because the the prevailing idea is that the market fundamentally sets prices, and what you're yeah. saying is that the government fundamentally sets prices because they're they're making the initial push of the money. Oh, okay, yeah. Any right? economist, yeah, any economist, he thinks hard enough will tell you that markets only set relative value. They tell you, you know, how much pizza is, you know, if a guy gets paid $10 an hour, a pizza is going to cost $10. Because pizza is roughly an hour's work, you know, in this market. You know, they'll do a big study. The car is going to be $40,000 if the person gets paid the same way, or whatever. Mm-hmm. And they'll tell you silver is going to be 100 times gold, something. You know, but these models come up with relative value. They have no source of absolute value in terms of Number of dollars. You just don't have it. There's no source of that information. It, the markets can only determine relative value. They need something to get started, and then the rest is relative value. So on the gold standard, you say, uh, you know, okay, the price of gold, the government sets it, $35 an ounce back. And then markets take that and run with it, and everything else is relative value. Today, they might say, okay, gold's at 1800 and then everything else is relative value, if you want to go back on gold standard. So you got to give them some information. Okay, you got to tell them it's dollars. If you say, oh, I, I, mean, I meant yen. Well, then everything's 110 times higher, right? Mm-hmm. That's all they care about. They're just waiting for some. So the only information for absolute value has to come from the government. There's no other place it can come from. And, and the mainstream models do not have a source of the price on them. They have relative value. And you have to tell them what prices were yesterday, like what your starting point is for prices. And, and they say, well, the, it, what's the source of the price level? They say, oh, it's historical. It's an infinite regression back to before the big bangs. And, and they, they don't have, and they just let it go. There's no, they have, they don't have the there's, there's, there's no logical description to say, okay, this is, this is where it no, came from. Because yeah. they don't recognize the sequence. They got the sequence backwards. And so there can't be a price source of the price level if you get the sequence backwards. And you, you mentioned it briefly that the, you know, the, the government has the monopoly on the, the, the currency creation. I remember that was the clicking point for me for MMT yeah. was yeah. I, I was I can't remember which lecture it was or video that, that, that you had. And you, you had the the, the, the uh, sectoral balances chart up and you were pointing out the fact that they're they're pretty much they're mirror images of each other. Yeah. And that's probably, that's probably <laughs> Um And that. There's no like the reason that these are mirror images of each other is because there's only one source of the money. There's no other yeah, place yeah, for yeah. the money to come from because the government has the monopoly on the money creation. And I went, duh. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, the government, the government, yeah, the government has the monopoly on the thing that it demands for payment tax. Right. I can loan you fifty dollars and you give me a note. And that note, somebody's going to send me his money. It's like okay, but it's not. You can't use it to go pay taxes. Right. Right, um, and the and the banks are agents of the Fed, so they're all. That's why their dollars can be used to pay taxes because the Fed, they're part of the system that the Fed right. has. And the Fed yeah, right. They have they have license basically yeah. from it. Right, yeah. right. I wanted to get yeah. into fr- yeah. fraud number two. Yeah. yeah. Um, with government deficits, we are yeah. leaving our debt burden to our children. Yeah. Our great grandchildren are going to be paying for this spending bill coming up, right. aren't they, Warren? Yeah. <laughs> right, 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 right. So there's a couple of things. First of all, it, it's absurdity, right? Because, you know, 20 years from now, um, you know, our children, if they build 20 million cars, they're not going to have to send them back to 2021 to pay off the debt. Whatever they build, they can drive, you know, and use. Whatever food they grow, they can eat. Whatever the GDP is, it's going to get consumed by the people who are alive there. In real terms, nothing gets sent back in time. In real terms, whatever gets produced gets distributed. And that distri- distribution is not controlled by what happened 20 years ago unless people in the future want it to be. They can decide, like the master, like the Europeans did, that we're not going to use that 3% limit anymore. We're going to 11. 
So, and, uh, and of course, fiscal policy is almost entirely distributional anyway. Right? So we're always doing that. So whatever gets produced in 20, you know, in the future, it's going to get consumed by whoever's alive in the future. And there's nothing going back in time. So anything they are talking about, about this payback or anything, can only affect the distribution of who gets to consume the future output. And that gets overridden and changed and modified and established continuously anyway. So that's not, there's no, there's no, for all practical purposes, there's no constraint on that either. Right. Well, and then let, let me, let me yeah. say the, the story that's, that's typically to- yeah. told in, in more explicit yeah. detail, which is okay, because the government has to borrow, which we already established it doesn't, but the government has to borrow a hundred dollars yeah. today. And it has to pay back $150 in the future. Therefore, the the future kids 20 years from now or whatever, uh, when when they're going about their work and they're going about their daily lives, um, when they're making their money, they have to come up with the burden of that extra $50 that their parents promised that they would pay. Yeah. So let's start at the beginning. So that goes wrong in the first or second phrase. And then that error gets compounded by the time you're at the end. (laughs) So the first thing is, the government borrows $100. So let's say it borrows it from you. You take your $100 and you buy a three-month treasury bill. So, so now you own a three-month treasury bill. So did you lose any money? No. You gained money, yeah. right? I mean, well, in, in, imperceptibly, because, right? Well, let's say the treasury bill is at zero interest. Okay. No, no you didn't get any money. Okay. But you didn't lose any money. So you, you already have the money. You already have that hundred dollars that the government borrowed. It hasn't taken it away from you. It's just shifted it from one account at the Fed to another. The public debt, the twenty-eight trillion, already is the money. It's dollars in securities accounts at the Fed that have been moved from dollars in reserve accounts that were going to be there anyway. Okay? Because if the government doesn't borrow that hundred dollars, you personally might spend it, but then the next guy you bought something from is going to hold on to it. Right? Or if he doesn't, somebody, by 3 o'clock on that day when the bank's closed, the government has spent $100, somebody still got it. Right. Okay, so it's going to be held by somebody anyway. It's not like it was going to be spent. Because if it was, it would have already been spent before 3 o'clock. The thing goes into the Treasury Securities, which, not that it matters that much, but they're entirely liquid. You can sell them to somebody else next door if you want. <laughs> not, you know, and, uh, it's, and, and so it's still the money. It's not like something other than the money. It mm-hmm. never changes forms. What it is, it's in a different monetary aggregate. M1 includes checking accounts. M, it does not include dollars in securities accounts at the Fed. It's a Federal Reserve Bank. Uh, it's a bank account. M2 includes money in checking accounts and savings accounts. A savings account is a time deposit at a commercial bank like Bank of America. But it does not include dollars in time deposits at the Federal Reserve Bank, which is functionally an equal bank to any other bank. People have time deposits. So M2 excludes time deposits at the Fed, but includes time deposits at commercial banks. And so um, you have instead of lending your money to instead of lending your money to the government for hundred dollars, if you loaned it to Bank of America. They would have moved it from your checking account to your savings account. And nobody would have said, oh, you know, that money's gone. They've taken that money away. They have to pay <laughs> it back. It's all the money. Okay, yeah. But when the, when the Treasury moves it, they say, oh, that's gone. They have to pay it back. You know, they, it's like it's functionally inapplicable terminology. Well, well and, and, and that's actually what, what, what I wanted to bring up is that it, yeah. I think we're using the wrong words to describe this stuff. Yeah, well, they're right. not wrong. They are what they are. If you get fooled by them, you know, shame <laughs> on you. <laughs> I mean, okay, good and point. Not, and it's not it's not deliberate subterfuge because there was a time under the gold standard where they were borrowing your gold. They did owe you gold. Right. And in 1934, they defaulted on that promise to give you gold. And uh, you lost. That dollar was worth a lot less gold and they had promised to give you more and you're not going to get it. Okay, so, but we just left the terminology, so maybe it's an anachronism, okay? And, and so the idea that the children already have the money now when it's borrowed, it's not like they're going to get it later. Or they're going to have to owe it later. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we're going to have to pay it back later. They already have it. It was never taken away. Okay, when you go 
put your hundred dollars in a treasury security instead of a you know checking account, you still you have it in 30 years, you still have it. It's not being taken away. But what can you do with it when it matures? You can put it back in your checking account. There's nothing else you can do with it. Right. The dollars only, only exist as numbers in bank account, basically time deposits or overnight deposits. And you want to make that's the only distinction we have. So we've shifted, we've offered uh, terms attractive to people to move to top term deposits. And in the future, if they want, they can move back to overnight deposits. But either way, they're going to have dollars in a bank account. Nothing's going to change. So that paying it back doesn't actually change anything. Now, it could have distributional issues, like you said. But that's a different. Yeah, that's a different matter. And distribution is always subject to political change. Right. Well, and I, I want to emphasize that because that was a big thing for me as well. Is that instead of instead of seeing this as as okay, we're borrowing money and paying it back, and oh my god, we got to find the money, and it, and what about the interest rate? And oh my god, is is to say yeah. okay, the the reserves and the treasury bonds are like a checking account and a savings account. Right. right. This one pays more interest, and it's time sometimes. delayed. You you, you can't <laughs> sometimes. Well, yeah, sometimes it's time delayed, and you and you can't spend it immediately without converting it into um. A, your your checking account, which is the reserves, but like you said, it's so liquid you could do that at any time. Yeah. And, and nobody does, but, you know, right? For spending, it's all investment companies that do that kind right. of thing, right? You know, the liquidity and things like that. So, yeah, yeah. yeah it, it's it, it's just money changing forms a little bit. It's it's Change not it's not positive money and negative money, right? It's just yeah. moving from one type of bank account to another, right? So so going back to whether or not our children are going to have this debt that. There is no debt in the sense that we're, we're using the term. It's it's not like right. you know, <laughs> I borrowed a hundred thousand dollars from you to build a you know to, to buy a house, and I got to pay yeah. you one hundred and fifty back. And if I don't right. pay it, you can come right. get my house right. because you're like, where's my money? <laughs> right. Yeah, it's right. it's not that. This it's completely like different. This is like if there's only one bank and you couldn't use cash, let's say Bank of America or something, City Bank, and you had a hundred thousand dollars in a savings account. When it comes due, it goes into your checking account. They say, all right, now what do you want to do? It just right. paid you back. You know, when, when Treasury Securities come due, the Fed debits the securities account, credit trees over the account, and says, okay, what do you want to do next? And they do it with a push of a button. And that. Yeah. Yeah. It's well, I mean, button. it's automatic now, right? But. Yeah, it's a scorekeeper. It's scorekeeper. Yeah. yeah. Let's. They're uh, just a scorekeeper. Yeah. What's that? They're just a scorekeeper for all this. Right. Actually, before I do number three, can you, can you tell the, the, the scorekeeping metaphor? Because I think that that's a oh. perfect way to describe what the, what the Federal Reserve does. Yeah, so um, it's like we're in a card game, and I'm the scorekeeper. You get a good hand, and I give you 100 points. Where did it come from? It didn't come from anywhere. <laughs> and if you lose 100 points, do I have more points now to give to somebody else? It's like, no. Yes. You know, or, you know, the scoreboard, should we, you know, when you go to a Super Bowl, and the guy kicks a field goal, and up. Gee, we've used up all the points in the, during the season. We can't give them any more points. Right. we gotta, no, we got to go borrow it's, points at interest. It's, just, it's like nonsense. It's yeah. not an applicable term. But So the Fed doesn't have any dollars. It does not have any dollars. It spends by changing your numbers up. It taxes by changing your numbers down. It's just a scorekeeping. Mm-hmm. The whole thing's just a big scorekeeping exercise. It's a spreadsheet. You debit one account, you credit another. Account comes along and says, okay, you're in balance. The debits and credits are equal. Oh, they're not equal. You made a mistake. Go find the mistake. Right. Right. Okay, let's get into fraud number three. Fraud three, the federal government budget deficits take away savings. We kind of already hit this, yeah. but I guess we can yeah, hit it exactly. explicitly. They are the savings. They just shifted the savings from a reserve account to a security. They're not taking anything away. And so that's why there's no crowding out. They don't drive up interest rates because the government spends first, puts $100 in your account, pays you. And then you just, some of it gets used to pay taxes. And you might spend it, but at the end of the day, whatever is left over buys a treasury security. It's not competing with anybody else for that money. If anybody else wanted to borrow, in the meantime, you could lend it to them and then they'd have it and they'd be the one buying the treasury security at the end of the day. Treasury securities are for the money that's still in these accounts at the end of the day, uh, you know, that's been left over, that's there because the government spent. More than a tax, it pays the number higher. Uh, maybe mm-hmm. you know, credit your account for a hundred, debit it for fifty. There's still going to be fifty there. You can only go back and forth to change hands, but at the end of the day, it's still there. And then somebody uses that to buy the security. So there's no crowding out. It doesn't drive interest rates. 
doesn't do any of that. It's, and every mainstream model is wrong. Yeah, that, I mean, that's they, what they, I, going back to that, they, it just keeps yeah, cracking me up. The sequence, they've got the sequence backwards. Yep. Well, and then speaking of backwards, it, it might actually be a better way to, to to convert this from from fraud to fact in another way. I could say the federal government budget surpluses take away savings. Sure, they double right? your account. You have less. Yeah, they 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 <laughs> taken more from the system than they put in. Oh, and then I like the way uh, these cases with guys go. Oh, well, we already knew that. Yeah, that's why you have all these peer reviewed articles that are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> journal, journal publication. You won Nobel Prizes for them backwards. Right. Right. And that, and that's why you call us crazy when we talk, bring this up. <laughs> well, also in our, our last conversation, we pointed out that these government budget surpluses have uh, regularly caused major depressions throughout the history of the United yeah, yeah, States sure. and any other country. Yeah. yeah, sure. yeah. Um, but, but they already knew all this. You know, oh, yeah. Nothing new, nothing new here. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, uh, Write it all down backwards. Well, it doesn't. Then they say, well, it doesn't make any difference anyway. You're going to get the same answer, right? Uh, get, you know, maybe in their model, but you're going to get a totally different policy. Yeah, that, that. Thank you for bringing that up. Is that that? That's the main point of this discussion, yeah. right? Is to say what yeah. what's the policy need to be, and with with the tools that you're measuring with the the yeah. modern economic understanding, you're coming up with really bad policy ideas. Well, what, what you've done is eliminate policy options okay. because saying they're not viable when they are viable. Right. So the infrastructure bill, oh, you can't pass this bill unless it's paid for. Okay, they've taken the option to increase the deficit off the table. Right, okay. which, which is, which is a, a political decision, right. not a right. – yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it's being done with the incomplete information, and that's the whole point. That's why it's an innocent fraud. See, they know it's a fraud and they're trying to pull something over or it's innocent. They just don't know how it works, which is probably worse, right? Right, right. Um, I had a topic, but I think we might get completely derailed if I go on that. So let's just go on to fraud number four. Uh, Social Security is broken. Yeah, we've been hearing that. You know, we're going to have to reform Social Security. Well, well, and then not only are we hearing that, what my generation is told yeah. is there won't be any Social Security by the time that we get old. Right. Right. And they may they may decide not to pay them. Right, but it's not because they ran out of money. Right. Well, the trust fund can run out. Of money. Oh, this is interesting. Okay. But the trust fund is just a ledger. It's record people. Mm-hmm. When they when they uh, tax you, they debit your account. And they credit the trust fund. When they spend, they credit your account. Did I say it wrong? When they tax you, they debit your account. They credit the trust fund. When they uh, spend. Give me my social security check, they credit my bank account, and they debit the trust fund. So they tax you three thousand dollars for your social security taxes. Your numbers go down, the social security trust fund number goes up. Uh, my, they give me a three thousand dollars social security check. My bank account goes up, the social security trust fund goes down. The tr- trust fund now has a zero balance. It's record key. It is a record of what they did. Right. They, and then, if the trust fund went to zero, yeah, it's not all, all they all they have to do is Congress says, "Well, we'll make it a billion, a hundred trillion no, dollars, just, just write it back up it again." Just, yeah, it just goes to zero. And if they then give me another check, it goes to minus three thousand. Nobody gets an electric shock. No bell rings. <laughs> it's like the, it's like the debt ceiling. Yeah. What happens if they violate the debt ceiling? Nothing. Nothing. They get their wrist slapped by Congress. They go to jail for violating the law. But it's not a monetary event. So there's no monetary event if the trust fund is negative. It doesn't make any difference. It's just a record of what's been done. So it's, it's a spreadsheet that tells you what you did. So the accountants can go back and, okay, the pot's right. You spent this much and you did this and the trust fund balance went up and it's, down. That's it's kind difference. of like, yeah. It's kind of Accounting like the European, is, yeah. Like the European Union's 3% limitation. Yeah. It's an arbitrary political limit, and they tell people, "Oh, if you violate this, then you're yeah. really you're really bad person. Yeah, they punish you." Yeah, I say yeah, we, we're seeing it that it doesn't really have any uh, relevance at all because whenever they want to, they suspend this rule. As you said, right, right. now Italy has a eleven percent right. uh, yeah. budget deficit. So I call those operational constraints. They're not operational constraints. They're political constraints. The Treasury can't spend. Until it would, you know, it has to have a positive balance in its account. 
It's not an operational constraint. But that doesn't you know, they let the account go negative. But Congress has put that in as a matter of policy. And Congress has put in the debt ceiling. These are not operational constraints. So the government is not constrained, but the Treasury is constrained because its boss, Congress, which is the government, has said, Treasury, you're my agent, but I'm constrained. You know, so you got to separate when somebody says, well, you know, the government is constrained and they point to the Treasury. Well, that's not the government. It's an agent of Congress. Congress is the government. They constrain, like the military. Is the military constrained operationally by who they can shoot at? No. You can be walking down the street and a soldier can shoot you if he wants to. Now, op- yeah, operationally, he pulls the trigger, you're dead. Okay, politically, he's not allowed to do that. He can suffer severe consequences. So these are the difference, you know, the ability to pay versus willingness to pay, operational constraints versus political constraints. Mm-hmm. And then he points these things out because they've gotten confused and they're limiting our policy options. Because the differences are all been conflated. So fraud number five. The trade deficit is an unsustainable imbalance that takes away jobs and output. Yeah. Well, what you know, the political response to the trade balance takes away jobs. And <laughs> but uh, not, you know, in any base case for analysis, the trade benefits a benefit. Now, uh, based on institutional structure and policy and what they do, yeah, it can be a real detriment because of, uh, you know, you pass, we have Congress and, <clears throat> and, and because of that, the reason it's a deadly innocent fraud is here we had Trump imposing the tariffs, which is a point when the economy at that point in time started to slow. The tax cuts that sustain the economy, you know, nothing great, it's okay. Uh, and uh, they're pretty well multiple. But then, as soon as the tariffs kick in, everything rolls over and starts going to accelerate. Then COVID hits, it goes down some more. COVID starts to alleviate a little bit. People going back to work. Biden doubles down on the tariffs, and we're still like getting hurt by these. Now we have all these uh, prices going up, which are hurting people's ability to consume. We're going up faster than wages. Tariffs, the supply disruptions has, you know. The tariffs are not independent from the supply shocks. A lot of it's COVID, but tariffs are contributing. They all think it's got 95 or 100% political proof that we've got to do something about China, okay, and the trade talks. And they've got 180 degrees backwards. It's another thing that they've got backwards. And that's why it's a deadly, innocent fraud. The trade deficit adds to your real wealth. It doesn't take away from because so it's bringing real goods in, while while yeah. whoever's bringing them in is just getting fake numbers on a spreadsheet. I mean, not yeah, a fake, but I mean, well, it's, I mean they're mad, you know, credit. yeah. They get a tax credit. So, yeah, um, it's fine if they want tax credits. So, um, but on the flip yeah. side of that, I, I do want to bring this up because I've heard yeah. you mention this before, and again, this this goes back to it's it, it's a political decision yeah. because our. Um, Steel was one of the big things that that uh, yeah. Trump was talking about, and he felt that, and I, I, I agree with this, is that a country should be able to make its own steel as a matter of yeah. of national security, not as a matter of economics. No, yeah, I know right? it's called strategic considerations. Right, where where you're so going? You know, well, we we don't want to be at, be at the behest of a foreigner to say, okay, you know what? No right. more steel, no more oil. <laughs> right. Yeah. And so right, and so what you do is um, you can have strategic. Things, but you don't pretend that that makes you wealthy or right. makes you better right. off. Yes, it's, it's like building a military doesn't make anybody richer. You just all these resources go into building military equipment, but without it, you're going to be a lot worse off. So there are certain things you do, like buying insurance that has a real cost that you don't benefit by. Okay, and if you buy life insurance and you don't die, you don't get that <laughs> <laughs> because it was you know there's a risk reward in it. Right. Okay. So. Uh, uh, you look, but you have to understand what your real wealth is. So this is the fundamental. So your real wealth is a pile of stuff. So everything you produce domestically is your pile of stuff. It's yours as a nation to conserve. Okay, all the goods and services. And the more people you have working, the more goods and services you have. So you're wealthier as a nation. So that's the imperative of full employment to maximize, optimize, and optimize in addition to it. But full employment maximizes your own. Output, the domestic output. So that's your wealth. Okay. In addition to that, anything you import makes your pile bigger. 
And anything you export makes your pile smaller. The difference between imports and exports <laughs> is called your real terms of trade. This is in all the old textbooks. You want to optimize your real terms of trade. You want to get the most for what you export. That's why you're doing it. Why else would you send something out except to bring something in mm -hmm. and you feel the exchange is worthwhile? Okay, that's why you do it. So keeping full employment is something we should always do in any case with what I call full employment policy, which means fiscal balance. It means making sure unemployed who are there because their tax was too high for the spending we did have an avenue to transition back into the private sector maintain full employment all the time. And with the right fiscal policies and what we call the job guarantee, you can maintain, you know, maybe the equivalent of a two percent unemployment rate, one percent, which will optimize your real output domestically, no matter what your trade is. Right. Yes, your budget deficit might go up and down, but that's just just accounting for what you did to optimize your full employment, which is your real wealth. Right. So so and then you know, looking at this this um uh... yeah. Fraud here. So the trade deficit. I want. I want to yeah. be sure that that I, that I have this right. Yeah. Trade deficit means we're sending out too much money well, in order to bring this stuff in, and that's well, negatively we affecting the economy because we, you know, we, we yeah. don't. We're losing jobs because yeah. all that stuff's going overseas. Whereas yeah. you're saying, well, sure, but you could, uh, you know, we could still employ everybody because that's just a political choice. Right. And, yeah. And, and, yeah. And look, recently what's happened is our trade deficit's gone way up, record deficit with China recently. And the government has been handing out stimulus checks and tax breaks and everything else, increased the deficit by five trillion. And uh, that sustained everybody's purchasing power. So nobody was hurt. Nobody lost any jobs because, of it because we had enough money through fiscal policy to be able to employ ourselves everybody who wanted to work, doing something else. We've had one of the fastest recoveries on record, <clears throat> which is now kind of stalling out, but uh, because of the opposite reasons, because the deficit suddenly has collapsed. But while the government was taking proper measures to offset uh, the lack of demand, I'm call it that, because of the trade deficit, lower taxes or higher public services, transfer payments, which is a kind of a lower tax, Giving you back your tax. <coughs> Excuse me. Then, uh, you know, we sustained it. We're fine. We had our largest um, trade deficit, real term deficit, in 1999. We had a massive trade deficit of like $400 billion. And we had strong GDP growth, which was one of the best years. And we had low unemployment and low inflation, both 3.5% unemployment, 2% inflation. We had a massive trade deficit. Well, at the time, the deficit spending was being done by the private sector. The private sector was spending more than like 7% of GDP. The government was actually running a surplus, which at the time was appropriate because, of, you know, you need enough private sector deficit spending to offset on spending income or public sector. You need, you need enough total deficit spending, private income. And the private sector was going gangbusters with, you know, private sector debt to the moon, right? Highest ever on record by launch. Well, and no, that, that was no, kind of setting, setting the grounds for 2008, right? 2001. Oh. 2000. Because, it, it, yeah, it was Y2K, and it was the dot-com boom, all the equity. That's all private sector debt. That was buying all that stuff, and uh, housing boom, all the mortgages and everything else. So it was good, you know, relatively good economics. Uh, and it was all fueled by private sector debt. When the private sector debt collapsed in 2000, that was the government's opportunity to now cut taxes and increase public services to sustain demand, but it didn't do that for a long time until the Bush tax cuts uh, and spending increases, prescription drugs for Medicare. Did I ever tell you that story? Maybe. But tell us again. Was, okay, so 2002, I think, the year before the election, no, 2003, 2004 election. Um, my wife and I get invited to the White House to go meet Andrew Carr, who was chief of staff, because the economy wasn't doing well. Interest rates were down to 1%. It wasn't working. They were worried about the election coming up. And George Bush, first Bush, uh, second Bush, he was president. And I wasn't a supporter of his policies, or anything, but it was a president. And I had a car company at the time. And on my board of directors was Dave McClellan, the General Motors engineer, and Joe Zimmer, the Ford engineer. And Dave was head of Corvette 
They went on top of it. He knew Andrew Carr because he'd been a GM executive with it and said, Hey, you got to go talk to Andy about this. And I said, Okay. So we ordered a West Wing and walked in. None of the photographers took our picture. <laughs> we sit in a waiting room. It was about 15 minutes late. There's a bowl of these little Snicker bars. So Elizabeth's taking the Snickers and put them in her pocket for souvenirs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and anyway, and he called, Andrew Card calls us in and a super sharp guy. And the first thing I go through is the interest rates, why they've got that backwards and why the 1% is making it worse and not better because all those pain and stock caused a physical contraction. Mm-hmm. He goes, yeah, why would anybody think rates are going to help? <laughs> then I explained how what you need is deficit spending, lower taxes, higher public spending. And he looks at it. Again, he's a systems engineer. The guy knows this stuff. He goes, yeah, of course. He says, well, how large does it have to be? And I said, well, I think back then it was like $700 billion, which was a lot. Right. <laughs> he goes, and he says, you don't have much time, do we? I said, no. <laughs> he says, okay, thank you very much. We got to get going on this. And we leave. And uh, I get a nice thank you note from him and all that. And a week later, President Bush is asked about the deficit. He goes, Look, I don't care about numbers on a piece of paper. I care about jobs. So you know where that statement came from, right? That's right. The and then um, within, this was maybe March or April, by, and he cut every tax he could. He had retroactive tax cuts. I don't know if you know that from the old one. He didn't have any taxes from last year cut and get money back. Mm-hmm. He, he spent everything he could. He made The reason they have prescription drugs covered in Medicare is because they needed to spend the money to get the deficit up. To, okay, and the deficit got up to 200 billion in the third quarter, which was about my 700 billion figure. The economy started turning around, and it didn't cost them the election. I won't say I won the election, but it would have cost them the election. It certainly was good enough for it didn't cost them the election. Did get reelected? So again, I wasn't big on his politics and all that. I, I, you're always torn as an American whether you want to promote somebody president, you know, disagree with, with the good of the country. But, right. You know, he, he was the elected official and, you know, I decided to do it. And so, uh, so that kind of answers your question there about, uh, something. I forgot your questions, but so on. I think I got a $600 stimulus check back then or, or something. Yeah. Okay. So you remember that. Yeah. 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 I, was I, was, I think I was too young. Yeah, it was a retroactive tax country. I, I, I wasn't even paying taxes at that point. Yeah. Um, so. No, uh, it, but in, in terms but of, in terms of what we were talking about, uh, yeah. I, I forgot too, but <laughs> I, I did, I did, <laughs> want to, I did want to point out is that, so when um, the guy said to you, we don't have much time, do we? He was recognizing the fact that there wasn't like that because the, pro- the private sector had popped essentially. Yeah, it, it 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 was a it was a time crunch before you know we got to get the spending out before the whole thing flops in on itself, which yeah happened, yeah. right? Yeah. So yeah, they, they they did this initial push for two hundred billion. You you thought the number was well, seven hundred no, billion? More than that. It was a lot more than that. That was just for the quarter. So that was the third quarter. It was like a seven hundred billion annual rate. So annual so rate. why did the crash still happen then? If it did, it this was after the crash. It started recovering after that. That was the beginning of the recovery. Wait, I thought we we're talking about two thousand four. 2001. Two, but, but, 2002. but I mean, it, it, the, the, the effects of the crash, excuse me, were really oh, felt we in 2008, in, right? Oh, 2008 was something else. By 2006, oh. the growth had taken the deficit down to 1% of GDP. And I had it in my blog, this is too small. It's not enough to support the credit structure. The mortgage housing market was already, you know, coming down because of the lack of deficit spending. And, uh, by 2008, it, you know, the, uh, first of all, OPEC decided to, Saudis decided to raise oil prices up to $155 a barrel, which drained the million, shifted money from people spending it to people who don't spend it. And, uh, uh, you know, so the net savings increase, that aspect of the trade deficit went up. And the government didn't recognize it. We, we left it everything. We had a $170 billion stimulus or something, you know, settled that actually resulted in 2.5% growth rate. And my partner, Kareem, says, he says, this is looking really bad for the rest of the year. This is first quarter. I said, well, let's just do another one. How hard is it? They just did it. But they did. They just let it all happen. It's like a slow motion train wreck. We didn't have another stimulus till like 2009 in the first quarter. Right. After, after everyone had lost their houses and their jobs and all that sort of. Yeah. 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 You know, they just wouldn't do it. So, um, 
So, but so anyway, that crash was separate from the recovery. I ne- that never occurred to me that, that the, yeah. those were two separate. Yeah. yeah 2001, 2008 were two, two, two separate 2001, cr- 2000, 2001 crash was bad. Really bad. That's when the NASDAQ went from 5,000 to 1,500. I mean, the markets dropped 70%. Mm-hmm. And unemployment was way up. Everything else. I was 15. I was... <laughs> Yeah, well, I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> what also uh, happened, I think, uh, towards 2006, 2005, 2006, throughout the whole, whole period, is that the U.S. Uh, current account deficit um, went up quite noticeably, I think, compared to previous decades. Yeah. And, and the budget deficit wasn't sufficient to offset that drain of net private savings from the private sector to the foreign sector, if I understand that correctly. Well, yeah, and there wasn't enough private sector debt either. So when you have unspent ink, in this case, the foreign sector is no different than somebody in North Carolina, you know, Texas with an oil well who sells oil and doesn't spend the money. So it's a question of whether you have unspent income or not. So when you have unspent income from any one person, any one agent, then you've got to have somebody else spending more than their income by that amount or else the output you know, doesn't get sold. Think if everybody decided not to spend any, GDP goes to zero. Right. Okay, so somebody, if everybody spends nothing, somebody has to spend all that $28 trillion or whatever GDP is this year or else it goes to zero. You know, and that person's spending more than their income. People with the income don't spend it. Somebody else has to. It could be private sector or public or non-resident or resident. Foreign sector is just people who don't live here. They live somewhere else. But it's, for dollar purposes, it doesn't really matter that much. Mm-hmm. Well, that actually it's leads us right purpose. into a fraud number six, I think. So fraud yeah. number six is we need savings to provide funds for investment. Yeah. Again, deadly, innocent fraud. Because of that, we have all these rules to uh, <clears throat> that you get all these tax advantages for not spending your income, putting it in an IRA or putting it in a pension fund. Mm-hmm. And uh, insurance reserves and all kinds of stuff, real days, 1031 deduction. We give people all these reasons not to spend their income, and that requires deficit spending on the other side, or else you have a total collapse. The output doesn't get sold. And uh, as things start to collapse, of course, the government starts doing the deficit spending if the project sector loan, which is fine. So that creates the need for deficit spending. Uh, and, and it also creates these massive pools of Manage money that wouldn't be there if we weren't getting all these tax advantages to not spend income and all the issues that bring. Yeah, well, I, is, I've I've heard the yeah. argument that because yeah. all the, all this money's in IRAs and four hundred one ks that needs to be invested somewhere, usually ends up in the stock market. That the stock market simply has too much money in it that's yeah. just sloshing around that that isn't there with people going. Well, I think this is a good company, so I'd like to invest in it. It's just I got all this money yeah. and it just needs to be thrown at something. Yeah, that's a little bit backwards. Oh, well then, okay. please that, please correct me. Yeah, and that the, um, you know, savings is the accounting record of investment. It, does, it isn't, savings isn't used for investment. Investment creates its own savings. Mm-hmm. And so um, if you borrow money to buy a house, you know, I, I was with this guy, Frank Cavanaugh, who wrote a book about, or something. It wasn't terrible, but at one point he said the uh, old people's savings is funding the mortgages for the young people when they buy homes. Okay, so you got all these old people with savings in the bank. Yeah, the banks have those deposits, and that's funding oh, because the he he's thinking of the the fractional reserve concept, well, even, right? Even the way it is, you look at a bank; they have loans and deposits. The banks take the deposits and make loans. That's how these things divide mm-hmm. down. Bank makes a loan and then funds itself. That's what he was thinking. I said, no, Frank, you got it backwards. He said, the young people borrowing 200000 for a house, buying it from the old person, they're dead. It's new money. The bank is buying their mortgage from them and, put it in, and using that money to uh, buy the house so that it pays per- old person who's selling it. So it's young people's debt that is funding the old people's savings. Right, because the old person ends up with the with the money that yeah, gets generated the from the bank. Out with the yeah, house and the mortgage. So you got to buy a house with a young person. You buy it for me. I'm the old guy, and it's two hundred thousand dollars. You say, okay, you go to the bank and they loan you two hundred thousand. 
and you buy the house from me. So, okay, so it's your debt that's funded my savings. Mm-hmm. Not the other way around. Can't. It doesn't exist. And, and technically, the bank is buying your signed loan when you take the mortgage. So it's actually bank spending that's funding my account, right? Right. So, so basically, I, I sign a note yeah. that says I promise to pay two hundred thousand dollars plus interest, right. and I hand right. it to you, the bank, and they they give me two, you know, two hundred thousand yeah. dollars gets created, and I give it to you to buy they the house. Buy that note yeah, they, just like they buy a bond. Yeah, it's a it's a financial asset. So bank loans are financial assets that the bank has purchased from the borrower. So it's always about bank spending. They say lending, but lending is a subset of spending. Technically, it's all spending. Mm-hmm. Operationally, it's all spending because the bank generates that money. Yeah, they spend it and they credit your account. It's yeah. new money. But you funded it by signing the note. I went to had 200000 if you hadn't signed the note. It doesn't exist. I'm stuck with the house. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can't sell that unless somebody funds it. Okay, and so um, and so Frank goes and goes, well, yeah, you know, I never thought about that. His Treasury Secretary for 33 years, Chief Economist at the Treasury for 33 years, had it backwards. Because they all have it backwards. So that's why it's a deadly innocent fraud. It's causing policy to... But they all have it backwards. <laughs> yeah, that's what the book's about. I know. I'm just visualizing, uh, you know, everybody running around with, with suits on and making decisions and thinking they're important and they just got it backwards. <laughs> I mean, grossly backwards. You know, yeah. It's grossly backwards. And, and it's so elementary. It's not like sophisticated backwards. It's stupid backwards. Uh-huh. And it's driving every bad policy we have. And that's why the, the book is there. And I think uh, what you just talked about um, is all. Uh, what I also wanted to add to that is uh, in mainstream economics, there's this belief of, uh, the, I believe it's called the loanable funds theory or whatever. Yeah. It says that banks wait for people to put money into them and then they go out and now we can lend out this money that we've, we have in our coffers over here. And what you just said basically shows how that is once again upside down. Yeah. What really happens is the bank starts with basic thing and they loan out money into existence and that money ends up in a bank account. So that's the reason why yeah. every for every loan there's a matching deposit. Yeah. It's not because the bank waited for the money to come in for the deposit so they can lend it out, but rather because yeah. whenever they do make a loan – that money ends up in some deposit. So the right. loans create the savings, basically. Right. So what banks need deposits for is to replace deposits that leave the bank. So if I take out a mortgage, they give you the money, and I buy a house from you, and you have a different bank, now the bank needs a deposit to replace mine. Not to fund my loan, but to replace the deposit that just left. They create a deposit. If it leaves, they've got to replace it. Here, here, now, I met Charles Goodhart in 1995 and uh it was back in England. Yeah. Really funny. Mm-hmm. And he'd been writing about this for at least 20 to 30 years before that. So this is one of the oldest things in these insiders in central banks. They all know this. Bank of England's had publications on this forever. They in a recent one a few years so ago. So they know, and it's not like they're keeping it secret. They're, they're making publications. No. You can go read it if you feel like it. Yeah. yeah. And, and the, the academics just keep running over. Now, on a fixed exchange rate, it's different, of course. Because you have to have somebody wants to take their money out, you have to give them convertible currency, not just you know, tax credit. So, um, but we won't get into that. So, part of it's an anachronism in thinking. Uh, you have a lot of very good economists who were writing in the, in the days of the gold standard, they were correct, but now people are just assuming it's, it's still the same. In today's context, it's not. I want to uh, bring up something specific. So, I'm, I'm Doing something else that I don't want to get into too many details of, but it's it's going to involve bank financing, and I've it, it's a business oriented thing, and I've probably in the last month spoken to forty different banks, thirty to forty different banks, and I didn't ask them all this question, but it's quite a few of them I asked, and I assumed that it was the case for everyone else because you know what they were saying is a lot of them said we're cash heavy, and we want to get money out. And they cash every because everyone's getting the st- stimuluses, and so the, the the deposits are heavy. So why, if they're, what's the reason that if they're cash heavy, that they want to get those loans out? Okay, first of all, they're always cash heavy. Yeah. 
banks always have infinite liquidity. Right. That, that, and that's what I thought. So that's why I'm wondering why, why these guys are, are, are so eager now to, to, they, to be lending they, because they're cash heavy. You know, I, I don't know that they're any more or less eager. They have always been eager to lend based on their lending standards, mm-hmm. based on getting an appropriate spread, 3% spread or whatever you're trying to get, which is competitive. And uh, if they're not growing their loan portfolio, you know, it's like a shark. They're, they're dying. And, and it's always like that. So you, you think it's just, it might just, just be part of their sales thing. pitch to say, yeah, oh, man, I really want to make you a loan because that's how I make my money. <laughs> and that's always the case. But here's an yeah. extra reason why you should come talk to me because I'm cash heavy. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. And then, and then, you know, next year they might say, you know, I really want to make a loan to you because I can get money in the wholesale market at you know, 0%. And if I can make a loan to you, I'm going to make it 3%. Mm-hmm. So uh, I really want to make that. If they say, oh, I want to make it because I have extra cash, what do you care? You know, so, yeah, that's the narrative of their bank. But if you look at the cash positions of JP Morgan and these guys, they've always been high. So maybe now some of the small local banks have more cash than from local deposits. Yeah, and, and I, I wasn't calling JP Morgan's. I was, yeah. My, my net total asset range was from about um, a billion to a hundred billion of banks that I was calling JP, JP Morgan's in like the trillions. Yeah. You might yeah. have been talking to mortgage banks, uh, or mortgage bank arms of these banks. They, they never have any money. So it's just a story. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was talking well, to, to, to the, to the business it's bankers. Not, yeah. It's got nothing, it's got nothing to do with their desire to make fun. Well, and then, I mean, I, I also wonder how much of, of these bankers don't actually know how it works. Yeah. All of them. Okay. That, that answers that. Well, um, one thing I would add to that is that, and Mike Norman talks about this from time to time, right. um, there's certain bank rules and standards that make it harder, actually make it harder for banks to loan out money if they have too much reserves uh, on their uh, accounts, from what I understand. Um, I wonder if you know anything about that. Warren. Well, banks have overall leverage limits, you know, where like you have maybe it's uh, 10 times overall, 15 times overall leverage. So if they have a billion in capital, they can have 15 million, billion in loans, 14 billion, no, 15 billion in loans. And um, if they've got, you know, 15 billion of assets, if they have two or three billion of assets in Fed, you know, with accounts at the Fed, then that's part of that. Thing, and then they're limited to uh, 12 billion. I, I don't know that that's limited lending in any real sense. Well, and then, uh, I, they actually, I actually I actually looked of, it up, what, yeah. what, what the rules are for limited lending. They're limited yeah. to what they can lend in individual. So if, if I've got... Yeah, they, uh, they have lending limits. They have individual lending limits. Individual lending limits. So it, but they it, have an overall limit also. They have an overall leverage limit. Like their footings can't be more than 15 times count. Right, but even, but even, but as they lend more, their 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 capital grows, not right? So uh, well. capital is a profitability. Okay, but they can raise more capital with stock or certain kinds of notes or kind of stuff. So they can raise capital if they want to, and they can sell their loans in the wholesale market. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I, you know it's true what Mike is saying, and some banks have complained about it because it tends to they don't it's, it doesn't work against the amount of dollars they earn. But it, work, it works against their percentage returns on assets. So if half your assets are going to be in these short-term reserve balances of the Fed, now your return on assets is going to go down because only half of your assets are going to make money. You make the same money. If you double your assets, you're going to make twice as much money. But if you have to double the amount in short-term, you're not going to make as much. So it's, it's more, um, it, you know, I, I don't some banks may have hit limits where they can't lend because of that. But they can always sell Fed funds to another bank. And, and the Fed can and always change. Look, the Fed can always change the rules. The regulators can say uh, reserves don't count as part of your overall lending. Right, and they should. And that's but, the but that's pretty, the so problem. Yeah. From from what Mike Norman was saying, that's what he thought they should be doing. They shouldn't yeah. count reserves as part of the bank's. Um, yeah, acid for those right. purposes. For those purposes, yeah. Mike, Mike's very good at it. I haven't talked to him in a while. But and what about um, 
I also heard at one point or another during this period of this massive cash injection into the U.S. economy, I heard that banks were actually turning down depositors from putting money into the bank. Have you ever heard anything? I haven't about heard that? that one. I know, but yeah, it's possible. Yeah, um, it was briefly, there was a, a, for a brief period, apparently certain banks were turning down depositors and yeah. it was apparently it was tied to this problem that they just, they had too much uh, deposits and it was counting as their asset base and it was sort of uh, messing up their leverage ratio and then they couldn't lend as yeah. much as they wanted to anymore. Yeah, yeah I can understand but again, go, go, going back to what you are saying before, these are all just policy decisions. Yeah, and it's right. a failure of regulation. You know, there's no reason to have that regulation. It's just bad regulation. So yeah. I know I know you got to, to jump at 11. Yeah. Or well, 11 my time. Got, yeah. Well, so I got to give the guy a few minutes. <laughs> we've got one fraud left. So let's, yeah. let's, let's hit it. So uh, fraud number seven is it's a bad thing that higher deficits today mean higher taxes tomorrow. Right. And, and that's what you hear all the time. Yeah, right. right. Um, it, they're saying, you know, if we run this deficit today, taxes are going to go up tomorrow. Well, if you understand the monetary system, that's actually a good thing. Because that means that you have higher deficits today, that the economy is going to be so strong in the future, unemployment is going to be so low that you're going to want to cool things down a little bit, demand down. And so therefore, you're going to raise taxes to cool things down to keep them from overheating, not to create a recession. That's a good thing. That's the kind of economy you want. Modern economy. Right. Things are so good that, okay, let's cool well, this down let's a little bit. Let's pull back a little bit so we yeah. don't. Yeah. yeah that's, that's a sign of success, not a sign of failure. Well, that was uh, that was an easy easy yeah. answer to that one. Uh, but before you had to go, I just wanted yeah. to, to open it up and and ask: Was there any commentary in general that you wanted to go over based on what we just went over, or anything that you want to hit on uh, the current events? Because they're obviously uh, I don't know, I'm not going to say that they're unprecedented, but I mean in the minds of a lot of people that they're unprecedented. Yeah. So. Um... There's a question now about whether we're going to trigger some kind of hyperinflation or something. Right. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay. Uh-huh. Okay. And, and, you know, right now what we're getting is some one-time price increases due to tariffs, which we're always going to cause that, no matter what you do, and because of, and the supply side issues, which tariffs are part of, and part of it is COVID. And those things, um, it's kind of like a snake swallowing a big animal. It kind of passes through. You can see the lump as it goes by in the charts. And we're getting these one-time price increases. Prices are, because of our institutional structure, are probably going to stay at these levels. But if they don't, if at some point, like after six months, they just stay at these levels and don't go up anymore after that, then you don't have inflation anymore. So if gasoline goes to five dollars a gallon, but then stays there, now you have zero inflation. It stays there while it stays at five. So inflation only is about how things change. Now, what happens, though, is that you get big distribution issues and you get changes in people's consumption patterns and other things. And, uh, and, and those are things that you want to deal with. But in any case, uh, the one thing they have backwards that's only touched on in the book, it's not an innocent fraud, but it would be the, the eighth if I had one, is that they, and I, I mentioned, they've got the interest rate going back. Right, high rates, right. High rates make inflation worse, lower rates, rates make, bring inflation down. So as long as we keep these zero rates in place, we've got a strong magnet that's going to bring inflation down. If they start raising rates like we did in 03 and 04, all the way to 06, then inflation goes up. Volker raising rates causes inflation to go up. And so anytime you see rate increases, they're causing the inflation to go up and it's worse. And then you, and that can lead to a recession, not because of the inflation per se, but because when the value of your savings goes down because prices are low, now you don't have enough savings. So you your restrict your spending. So you restrict your spending. If you're a merchant, you don't have enough cash in your cash register. If you're Apple, you don't have enough cash in the balance sheet because development costs twice as much in the chips. And so you restrict your spending. When your spending is restricted, you get a recession unless the government has enough sense to act on a cyclically, increase public services or, or taxes or something. 
which they generally don't. So we're now at that risk, a couple of risks here. Um, and, and one of the, I think the way it is, if we leave rates at zero, we're okay. We have a risk of rates going up, which will institutionalize inflation, cause it to get worse, and will keep getting worse until the lack of savings causes a lack of consumption. The deficit gets too small. The P gets too small and we collapse. Uh, and that happened in 1979 under current. Okay, it wasn't poker that brought down the economy to this high rate. So high rates made the inflation worse. Savings in real terms after inflation collapsed. Uh, the deficit was um, six or seven percent, but inflation was 10 or 12 or 14. And so real savings was contracting in the economy. People stopped spending and that came, caved in. And that cave in brought oil prices down and they left the rates high. Instead of inflation coming down immediately, it took years because the high rates continue to propagate for the next 10 years. Mm-hmm. That's my story. I'm skipping to it. <laughs> and uh, instead of tariffs, we had deregulation, which helped. Carter's deregulation helped a lot to keep prices down after that. Natural gas substitute for oil only because Carter's deregulation. That's it. We're not doing that today. We're really not. We've got a major problem where Putin is now controlling oil prices. It had been Saudi Arabia, which was bad enough. Then during COVID, he had, Saudis had to cut a deal with the Russians because they couldn't, they just set price like they did the production of the guns to zero without somebody else in OPEC cutting production. Putin came in, made a deal with them, he would do it, and now it's payback time. He gets to set the price. They're buying weapons from him or whatever. You know, he's the new buddy. And I don't know how high they're going. It's been 100. In 2008, the Saudis on their own went to 155. And it's just a decision. It's not the markets, it's not supply and demand and so except the oil minister and the king deciding what the price was and now bring in the you know, Putin in that decision for the disproportionate influence. Mm-hmm. And I can't tell you where it's going to go, but that that could cause a continuous increase in prices through the cost side until they stop. It could cause a massive setback. Are they going to do it? I don't know. They could decide they don't want to do that though. 40 tomorrow. I mean, it's their choice. So we're at their, we're at their, uh, that's the risk. And I've got to run on it right now. Well, all right. I mean, I, I was going to, I was going to say we should probably wrap well, it up. So, um, sure. uh, uh, we super appreciate you coming back on, Warren. Um, yeah, we're, you're good. welcome to come back on anytime that you want. And, okay, uh, this has been Dylan Moore with Irita TV. We got Nima's co host, and once again, Warren Mosler, our guest. And, uh, thank you everybody for watching. We'll see you next time. Very good. See you guys. Thanks.